Josh Jackson from Detroit, Michigan, small forward. And I'm the number one player in the country. Josh Jackson is a big time talent. There were some questions about him, but he may arguably be the greatest talent in the draft. Uh, Josh Jackson's got everything. You and the G. Heading his four month old daughter high. Neely. Josh Jackson was in the position that you and I can only dream of. Best player in the country, all the hype in the world, with college coaches and media giants paying to catch a glimpse of you. For most, this seems too good to be true, because for most, it truly is. Josh Jackson was born in 1997, while his mom was serving in the Navy. She was no slouch herself, turning down an invite to the Washington Mystics training camp to set her focus on raising Josh, moving from San Diego to the Detroit area to be closer to family when Josh was just a baby. His childhood wasn't always easy. He lost his stepdad, who's the father figure in his life, in 2014. But one outlet he always had was basketball. At times, he overstepped from passion to an obsession. He had to repeat 8th grade reportedly due to the love of the game, overtaking his grades. I wish that one worked on my mom. But once he got to the high school game, it was very kind to him. He came in playing super well his freshman year, but his sophomore year was just an explosion. He was a top player in the nation. He led Consortium College Prep to their first state title ever, averaging 28, 15, and 6 before moving back to California to play for Prolific Prep. This is where the national attention started to blow up. He averaged over 30 points a game, proving to be the top player in the country. This 6'8 gem with a 6'10 wingspan could fly around in the half or full court, taking guys off the bounce and finishing well above the rim. He was pretty brilliant as a facilitator as well, being able to generate lots of easy buckets off the heaping amounts of attention that he drew in. After finishing his senior year as the number one guy on most rankings and as a co-MVP of the All-American game, the ball was in his court when it came to recruitment. Everyone knew him, and everyone wanted him. It came down to MSU, Arizona, and Kansas. He teased a commitment to Arizona, while many people were banking on him going home to MSU, but to Kansas it was, and he had the talent to come in and be impactful, and that he sure was. Kansas doesn't typically rely on freshmen a ton, but this was an exception, as Jackson told it averages of 16, 7, and 3 with a block and nearly two steals a game. A few things were evident with Jackson's game. He was an above average athlete, no doubt, and his IQ on the floor turned this into his biggest weapon. He was very dangerous leaking out in transition, and forced a lot of transition opportunity by being very active in passing lanes as well. On ball was no drop off either, his defense was incredible when he wanted to be, and he had the switchy versatility that the NBA loves so much. Scoring in the half court was interesting. He could take his man off the bounce sometimes, he wasn't the primary ball handler but the athleticism allowed for occasional isolation success, and even at that he still managed to average 3 assists, which shows his general comfort with the game at this level. It wasn't just passing the ball either, a great deal of his production came off of cuts and spot ups, which made him a very easy guy to play with. The biggest perk to having Jackson on a team was the versatility that he provided at a long and athletic 6'8". He was played at the 2 through the 4 and excelled at all those positions. At times he can come in and be your best defender, best scorer, best rebounder, or best creator. I mean he can fit a lot of roles that you want, but other times he just wasn't that guy. He was sporadic and at times seemed a bit out of control, barreling at the rim and eating some forced garbage at the backboard. His touch was kind of questionable at times, but the biggest question was in his jump shot. He knocked down the three ball at a 37% rate on three a game, which is pretty good, no doubt, but he was just very streaky with his shooting. The problem and solution were very evident, especially when taking into account his 56% free throw percentage. He had to fix his jump shot form. This almost always proves to be less of a problem for college players, but moving the three point line back a couple of feet, and you're almost useless out there. Just look at his classmate in Lonzo Ball. The inconsistency didn't just happen on the court. He was also known for his immaturity. He was always very emotional in a pretty piss poor way, with no time more evident than February 2nd, 2017. He went out with the boys on a weekend when Mackenzie Kelvert, a member of the women's team and ex-girlfriend of teammate LeGerald Vic, threw a drink in Vic's face. Josh and LeGerald then followed her out to a car and totally destroyed it, causing thousands in damages. Josh also threatened violence against her in an act that was eventually brought to the police. He got off with a slap on the wrist with an anger management class and some more BS, but to Kansas, this was enough and they hardly punished him at all. His college career ended in the hands of the Ducks in the Elite Eight after a performance pretty consistent, or well equally inconsistent, to a season performance. By the sounds of it, Jackson could probably use another year to develop as a player and mature as a man, 
but I guess the NBA money was just too tempting, being a lock of an early lottery pick. As the draft came, Markel was the best prospect, then Lonzo, it was going to go in that order. Jason Tatum was basically a consensus for number 3 to the Celtics, and Josh Jackson was expected to go number 4 to the Suns, but Josh had quite a few supporters backing that he was the best prospect in this draft overall. So if someone's going to jump a spot, it was probably going to be the Celtics taking a different wing. This went from a long shot to a no shot after Jackson cancelled on Danny Ainge who was on his way to meet him, again a red flag entering the league on where he stood maturity wise. The draft stayed consistent 1-4 through four to the mock draft and Jackson saw himself teamed up with up and coming star and Devin Booker. The potential was there to make this thing work. Jackson caught a lot of comparisons to Andre Iguodala coming into the league for his versatility, and a prime Andre Iguodala next to Booker sounds like a pretty killer pairing. A two-way playmaker who doesn't need the ball is a great match with an all-around bucky getter. This team was up and coming basically just because they had D-Book, don't get it twisted, these guys still sucked big time. They wasted their first rounder on Dragon Bender the prior year who basically did nothing but have a cool name, and their only other guys over 15 a game were TJ Warren and Eric Bledsoe. Not bad players, but not exactly doing a ton to build a core for the future. Coming into the NBA, Jackson had some life in his game. He was played at the 2 through the 4 throughout his rookie year, offering lineup versatility to the Suns, but they were a bit impatient with him this year as he again proved to be pretty inconsistent. He was the player that he was in college, basically just playing against better competition. He finished the year with 13, 4.6, and 1.5 averages with a steal a game on some pretty shaky shooting splits. The totals are not bad by any means, and his defense was about average with glimpses of potential throughout the year. There were times that his defensive IQ looked solid, jumping in passing lanes, helping on defense, and making great switches, but other times it just looked less so. Despite the solid totals, he was still very ineffective on the floor. Throughout the year, the team was 6.8 points better per 100 possessions with him off the floor. His inefficiency scoring the ball, tendencies to play at an out-of-control pace, as well as not always being put in the right position, causing to be a net negative during this time. But all in all, I wouldn't call this a net negative season. Yeah, he didn't help you win games right out the jump, but he's a rookie on the Suns. I mean, they didn't draft him to lead them to anything out the gate. He had glimpses of what he could be. I mean, Darius Garland was the worst player in the NBA coming into the league. They don't utilize a minor league system in basketball like other sports, so in many ways, this was his development period. Finishing at 21-61 allowed for the Suns to grab the number one pick in the draft, in which they drafted DeAndre Ayton, and this filled a much needed hole and started to kind of solidify this team's position as an up and comer. Jackson was voted onto the All Rookie second team with the general consensus that he was kind of just a big wait and see kind of guy. Going into the next year, Josh looked very, very bad at the jump. This was a sophomore slump, no doubt. He averaged 8.7 a game on 38 and 29 shooting splits before the new year with a negative assist to turnover ratio. His role was again pretty inconsistent, but not as inconsistent as his play. At times, he looked like a phenomenal defensive talent, and other times, he was just average. And that's not exactly going to cut it when defense is your biggest selling point in the NBA. As the year went on, Jackson seemed to slow down his out-of-control antics and started to play better, totaling 14 a game on 43 and 34 shooting splits, but really statistically his only improvement was in his jump shot, which is certainly valuable. But the speed of the NBA limited him in transition as he struggled to make great decisions on the break. His progression was very slow and it's also safe to say that when he was at his best he still really wasn't the offensive player that we thought he would be. He was athletic but not athletic enough to be the all around slasher we thought. He had no touch around the basket and he really wasn't an off the bounce creator either. He made the occasional good pass but after he threw a couple away or charged through a couple guys forcing a turnover or a waste of a shot attempt. And his defense was not really exceptional overall either. He wasn't really turning a ton of heads. There were problems in his game, but Jackson's biggest problem was his maturity. He made a number of bad off-the-court decisions that stunted his development. He struggled to get along with some of his teammates, yelling at practice in a way that just didn't make him look very great, especially taking into account that this is the same guy that was suspended a game for coming to a practice hungover and throwing up in the middle of it. It didn't end there after an arrest at Rolling Loud for resisting arrest after trying to sneak into a restricted area multiple times and was rumored to get his five-month-old daughter high on secondhand smoke according to his ex-girlfriend. The ridiculous off-the-court antics and piss-poor offensive game plummeted Jackson's value. It was expected that the Suns were ready to part ways with him, but the surprise came in just how hard Jackson's value had tanked. The Suns came to an agreement sending Jackson to the Grizzlies for Corver and Javon Carter, basically just freeing up cap space and freeing themselves of Jackson and his antics. I mean, they even had to throw into second round picks just to make this trade happen. He was not too valuable around the league. 
In many ways, people still think that Phoenix gave up on Jackson too early. There's no for sure reason why they chose to do so, but from what we've seen, I would chop it up to the possible potential of him filling the noticeable holes in his game was not worth the off-the-court issues that came along with him. Josh Jackson was pretty replaceable. Jackson was truly a gamble. He was yet to put up a BPM north of negative 4, that's just terrible, and even his defensive rating was below league average for what was supposed to be the strongest part of his game. The Grizzlies decided to boot him down to the G League to start a year. This was a kick to the ego for someone who was the number 4 pick in the draft just 2 years ago, while some of his draft mates are at all-star level talents in the NBA. Playing in the minor leagues, he played excellent, and I'll give him credit for the mental toughness that this takes. Putting up 27-4 on really good splits is a great way to respond to this, and the Grizzlies took notice reinstating him on the roster. This was a good decision, and a good response both ways, I'd say. It seemed like he caught a little traction in the NBA, upping his effective field goal percentage to over 50% for the first time in his career. His play was still inconsistent, it's just kind of weird with this guy. At times, he looked like the biggest bust I've ever seen, and at other times, he just made you eat your words. It kind of seemed like he just couldn't put it together, and as a role player, you're not going to want someone who can't do their role more than once every few games. According to the advanced metrics, his 22 game stretch was the best season of his career. He had a pretty close to neutral BPM with a defensive rating of 109, and he kept the ball rolling, although he must have been rolling it up a hill or something after the Pistons signed him to a two year deal with a consistent role in the rotation. His 13 point per game average with shaky splits was okay I guess. He was basically the player he always was, at times he looked like he finally started to figure it out, and then he just started to decline. The next year was just absolutely awful in his contract year. He put up 6 a game on 40% from the field and 25% from the 3. That's just not going to cut it. He was dealt to Sacramento partway through the year, and where he was kind of the worst player in the league. He put up 4 a game on 34 and 17 splits with 2 turnovers for every assist. The very poor performance at the end of his contract year meant that he would not play another NBA game up to this date. He signed to the Raptors who waived him shortly after, and was even waived by the Stockton Kings G League team just 4 weeks ago. The fall of Josh Jackson is pretty interesting. Many people want to point to the off the court issues as the sole reason for Jackson not cutting it, but there was more than that certainly. Through watching Jackson's play, he's clearly an NBA level talent, but he cannot produce NBA level production. There's not much value in an inefficient scorer, who really can't shoot much at all, and an athlete who's held back by his bad decision making, leading to turnovers, bad shot selection, and overall just out of control play. Being an average to slightly above defender doesn't make up for being a large net negative on offense, and the off the court issues make it easier to just replace the guy than gambling on his development. Jackson's NBA case is a weird one. In a different timeline, maybe there could have been a better ending, and in a lot of ways we really don't fully understand what caused the dramatic stunt in his growth. And I really couldn't tell you what's to come in the future for this guy. Maybe he'll catch a break or maybe he'll fade further into relevance, but at this moment this is the Josh Jackson story. Thank you for watching and peace out.